Good morning, my forever family of God. It's a, it's a vibrant bunch. This is going to get bad. I can feel it already. It's been a tough year, 2020. Who was the knucklehead that prayed for revival in 2020? I thought you just see beautiful truth and everyone gets excited and you live for Jesus and God's too good to not crush us and take away idols and false hopes and bring us to the only thing that matters, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I thank him for that. And I just want you to get this. 2021 is not the answer. Okay. I, I hear that too much. That's not the answer is I exult in God and he is sufficient and he is where we're going to keep journeying. You might look back and say 2020 was the easiest year of my life. So get, just our hope is God, not 2021. As most of you know, the elders sent out an email this week sharing you with the journey that we've all been going on during COVID. And our goal is just to glorify God and shepherd this flock together. And as always, God has worked these nine months for our good. He's made me wrestle in a hundred different ways with different things through each season. But I think the last few weeks have been the most purifying in my own life. I, I have found some deep-rooted uh, victory and deep-rooted battles that I've had uh, for, for seasons and long times, and just God is doing mighty things uh, in my own heart, and I thank Him for it. The fruit of the last two weeks with the elder board has really, it's birthed a deeper and truer love than I've ever had in my heart uh, for these men, because I want you to know what, what we're wrestling for is to, to be led by the Word of God and our consciences for the best way to shepherd the souls and that's what every heart, I can die on that hill. Every one of them are wrestling uh, for that thing. And so there's been real hurts, false hurts, confusion, differences, self-inflicted wounds, unbelief, my own anxiety. But uh, I feel a deeper trust that we all love God and want to shepherd his flock supremely. And so what's come out of uh, the last few weeks is this morning we had a, a second service for those whose consciences would want to continue to, to abide under the Colorado uh, government regulations. And I just want to encourage you, that was an amazing service. And there were faces I haven't seen for nine months that because of it were able to, to not be at home and come and worship. And we had communion together. And uh, what a blessing. So as I look at Romans 14 with conscience issues of eating meat or not, there, there's one command in that section. And that one command is that you receive one another. And not to judge one another, look down, condemn. And so the, it's just a sweetness that we can have differences in conscience and we can receive one another greatly. And so I just uh, was blessed in that last service. And uh, I am giddy for this one as well. Let's, let's go. The good news is it's, it's Communion Sunday. What a good providence. That is what reminds us of the ties that bind us together. Uh, I long for the day when we all sit in the same building shoulder to shoulder with our sweet Savior again. And so the commitment is the elder board will keep studying, talking, trying to work unto that end. So may the table remind us this day of the beauty of being diligent to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That word diligent means sometimes you got to really, really work at that. And, and, and really, it's bigger than being right. It's about being righteous. And we got to keep fighting to, to keep what really is the most important thing, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we labor for that. And so let's, let's fight for, for, for the glory of God. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, there's three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And I pray that uh, because of the great love with which God has loved us, that we will abundantly love one another. And so we're going to go to the table and and it's going to be a rich day together as the body of Christ. Um, we need a special prayer, too. It's a technical, long sermon. Uh, if you will journey with me, the, the gift at the end of it is unbelievable. So just kind of wake up, get ready. It's, 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 there's a lot of work in the text this morning, but man, is it beautiful. So let's ask God's blessings for that. Father, I come before you, and, and I am so grateful to worship with your people. God, I was so glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. My heart is so full with this joy. And I thank you for this group 
who desire to know you and love you and follow you. I pray this morning that you will meet us in the word of God. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be so taken up with the doctrine that's before us in this passage. God, I pray, illuminate it. Let us see it. Let us behold it and be metamorphosed into your image as a result of the truth that we're going to look at this morning. And so, God, we, we praise you and we thank you. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. I'd like to just ask you a question as we begin is, who would you like to be your cruise ship director? Ed Smith or Art Roston? For both of these men were captains of two ships on the same day, April 14th, 1912. Captain of the Titanic, and Art Roston was the captain of the Carpathia. And both of them were traveling on the same waters. At 11.40 p.m., Ed Smith was warned of icebergs in the area on the North Atlantic. And the captain switched course, but he continued at full speed ahead. The Carpathia was on its way to Croatia, and it received a distress call at 12.15 a.m. about the Titanic, that it hit an iceberg and it was sinking. They were 58 miles away from the Titanic, and Captain Roston turned around and he went on a rescue mission. The Titanic, I'm having a hard time with that word, went down in two hours and 15 minutes, and there were 75 survivors that they came and picked up, and 1,500 passed away that day in those waters. My point as we begin this morning, it's quite simple, is it does matter which ship you're on. And the passage before us is going to bear that out like never before. Paul's going to bring up two historical events to your minds that are separated by thousands of years, yet amazingly connected. And they're going to be Adam and Christ, the second Adam. And the first event, we're in a garden called Paradise. God has just created and he's declared his creation is very good. Shalom, peace. Everything is right. God and man in creation are just dwelling together in perfect harmony and perfect unity. The, the event was a very private scene. No one else around but Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. And the event is just simply recorded this way. <clears throat> God has told Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree except the one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're forbidden to eat of it. The serpent, Satan, comes and he tempts Eve and deceives her into eating of the tree. And we are told she took from its fruit and ate. She plucked the forbidden snack in the garden. She gave to her husband to eat with her. And in the Hebrew, it's just one word. He ate. And that's the historical event. And from that moment on, the whole of our ship called humanity was breached and broken. And the waters of sin and death entered into this perfect world. And now it's a sunken ship. He ate. One Jewish writer said, oh, Adam, what have you done? For though it was you who sinned alone, the consequence was not for you alone, but for all of your descendants. Adam, what have you done? That's what we're going to flesh out this morning together in the Word of God. I'd like to take you to the second event that Paul records in this section. And this event was thousands of years later. This was not in the Garden of Paradise. This, this began in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it moved on to Golgotha where he hung on a cross. It was not a private scene. It was very public. It was not a safe environment, but a scene of hatred and evil and pride and slander and malice and murder. It's the worst scene ever recorded in the history of this earth. And where the first place was sinless and the first Adam sinned, now in this place, sin surrounds it. And there's a sinless one hanging up on a cross as the object of their scorn and their hatred. Luke says on that cross was the son of Adam. And he hung on that cross and in full love and submission to his father, he gave up his spirit and died. And so guys, there's two events. Adam ate and Jesus died. Dare I say these are the most significant events in all of history. If you're to ever understand this world and your existence and why things are as they are, you're going to have to understand these events. 
for your eternal soul hangs on these two events. And there are no two events more significant in terms of what they mean to our race and what they mean to us individually than these. And so this morning, in the, the next few weeks, we're going to be studying this passage of Romans 5, 12 through 21 in, in hopes of preparing our hearts for the Christmas season. God sent his son into the world on a rescue mission from the titanic of humanity that Adam had sunk to seek and to save that which is lost, to bring about salvation. And I want you to focus on this one question, the question that we all must ask, whose boat are you in? For all of humanity is in either one. Either one or the other, whose boat are you in? Our history and our future are hinged on these two events and these two persons. And our hope can only be found in the second Adam, the Carpathia of our souls. And so I'd like to pray one more time and we'll open up the word of God together. Father, I thank you for the ship that was sent on a rescue mission. The ship was the Lord Jesus Christ, the ark of our souls, the one who can rescue us from the wrath to come, the one who can rescue us from the sin of Adam, the one who can rescue us from our sin daily. God, I thank you for this gospel, and I pray that you come in power and you illuminate this word and you set people free and you reveal the glory and the beauty of such a picture that you have put before us this morning. God, have your way with your children, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the most important lessons to learn in interpreting Scripture is the context. So we come to this new section, verses 21 through 31, and you've got to ask yourself, why? Why does Paul bring this section up now? How does it tie into the flow and argument of Romans? <laughs> Honestly, Romans 1 through 5 has just overwhelmed my heart. It's been so beautiful and glorious. And, and we just got done with the exalting section three times. I exalt, I exalt, I exalt. And so kind of like, let's move on now where we're ready for Romans chapter six. That's how to live in light of the gospel. Just Paul, turn me loose. What, what do I got to do? Let's, let's move on. Why do we got to do 5, 12 through 21? And 5, 1 through 11, and then a history lesson. It just doesn't feel right to give me a history lesson after what we just looked at. So we got to start with then why, and it's therefore. And you know how much I love therefore. What is it there for? Why, Paul, what, what's the there for? It means on account of all this. I'm going to bring a history lesson of the first and second Adam. I just see this, this therefore is so pregnant with meaning and possibility that I just want to start before we even look at the text. What could the therefore mean? So for some of you, this is going to be boring, but it just entertain me. You've got to know what the therefore is there for. In 5, 1 through 11... Paul says we have hope in the present and we have hope in the future when we stand before our God in judgment. He says we are justified and he can save us from the wrath of God on the last day when we stand before him. We are reconciled, he said, now and we're reconciled forever. And the question is why? And he said three times, Christ died for us. And the question is why did Christ have to die for us? And the answer is, is Adam. He said, while we were helpless, ungodly, and sinners and enemies, Christ died for us. We labored in Romans 1 through 3 for a long time, and it just revealed powerfully and personally my guilt that there's none righteous, not even one. There's none who does good. There's none who seeks for God. All have become rotten fruit and useless. I mean, it just opened us up, and you had to stare at your own humanity, who you are, and realize, man, I am a broken sinner who can't fix this. There's no hope for me in my own strength and just a little bit of religion. And so the question, though, is why? Why am I so broken and sinful? I had a kid who, he always asked, why? And you see, some people like that. I'm kind of a bottom line guy. And, and I, he, everything, he'd ask you a question and he'd say, why, why? And he just kept, he never, you could never get it answered. So my, my usual comment was, go ask your mother. She, 
She loves details, and she just would go on for 40 minutes answering all his why questions. But this morning, I could picture him this morning just going, why? Why are we so broken? Why are we sinful? I need that answered. Go a little further for me. Why is this world the way it is? The things you're watching right now in our country are overwhelming. Why? Quit. It, you know what? It's not a party, Democrat or Republican. It's not COVID. Why are things this way? Well, that's going to be the answer. If you don't get this, you'll always get the wrong solution or an inferior one. Romans 5, 12 through 21 tells us why and how. This is how I got so broken. This is how my world has gotten the way it is. So what we're going to see this morning is amazing. And I want you to get this. It's not just some interesting parallels between the first and second Adam, like, wow, that's, that's kind of cool. But this is a fundamental structure of how to view all of reality. It's a paradigm of how you're to look at life. This is the most foundational structure possible. Are you in Adam or in Christ? There's no other realm of existence. A second reason for the therefore. We've seen this amazing doctrine of imputation. If you're visiting this morning, man, you missed the beauty of the gospel. Imputation is that Jesus Christ came and lived the life we should have and died the death we deserved. And God will, will take our sin and impute it to Jesus and put him up on a cross and punish him for our sin. And he will take the perfect life that Jesus lived and impute it to us so that now we stand before God in a perfect righteousness the doctrine of imputation. And we learned then that we can be declared righteous by the work of one man, someone who lived 2,000 years before me. He could come to earth and live and die, and that could be put to my account, and I could be constituted righteous before God, truly, fully, and holy. The question is, how can that happen? Does God really treat people that way? It just seems so out of place. The whole Bible is, if you act this way, judgment will come. If you act this way, reward will come. It, it's always do this and you get this. And all of a sudden, I didn't do anything and it's given to me. I, I, does, does God really treat people like that way? And the answer this morning is you better believe it. He's always done it this way. It was his big plan and picture. And we're going to tie all that together. We're going to answer that. Thirdly, and I promise this is your last one. This is a linchpin, because we're going to shift now to Romans chapter 6 through 8, and that is how you live out the Christian life as a justified believer. And I think one of the most important things in the Christian life is how do you transition to chapter 6 through 8? More cults and heresies come from this transition. And so we've been working hard so that you wouldn't just say, okay, I got to start working in the Christian life and be better, and then I can know I'm justified and right with God. That's the opposite of the gospel. You got to hammer this out. I'm justified. Therefore, here's how I live the Christian life. And so this is going to be very important that we make this transition well. And this section is our transition section. <laughs> we've seen for a year that we are saved by grace this grace in which we stand this morning. And the grace, it's not just, hey, I'm saved. It's not just a concept. Grace is found in only one source. And that source is Jesus Christ. And that's where we find this grace for salvation, sanctification, and glorification. And so what I want you to get is which boat I'm in. I get into Christ's boat. It's a rescue boat, but I don't climb a ladder to get into the boat, which is called law. I believe in him, and I'm joined to him in a vital union and a relationship. And so this whole gospel flows from being joined to Christ. He's the fount of every blessing, and, and, and faith joins me like a vine and a branch. And so everything now is going to flow from Christ. If, if you don't get union with Christ, you miss the whole gospel. Your whole Christian life might just be dead and going nowhere because you've missed union with Christ. And that's going to be the foundation to our sanctification. How we grow is going to come from union with Christ. So this is where it gets really beautiful. The hope trumpeted in Romans 5, 1 through 11 is only because Christ has overturned the reality of Adam's sin. 
So what we lost in Adam, we're going to gain tenfold in Christ. So the power of grace is greater than the power of both sin and death that Adam plunged us into. So I want you to see these two are going to be compared, but they're not equal. And he's going to say at the end of this, where grace, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So the second Adam, it, they're not equal. It, it can engulf and overcome and encompass what Adam did and the destruction that he brought to humanity. And this power is called grace, and it can take you from the guilt of sin and the power of sin and one day the very presence of sin. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this is the most important section in Romans. Is it warm in here? Is there someone that knows how to turn the air on? I'm taking the coat off. Are my pits all wet? If they aren't, they're going to be, because wait till you see where we're going this morning. Okay. Therefore, I'm going to give you your outline, but there's one last little word I want to talk about before I give you your outline. And that's the glue that's going to hold this whole section together, is it's the word in uh, verse 14, it's the word type. This whole thing is a type. Adam was a type, which means a pattern or a picture of the second Adam who was to come. He, he's picturing something bigger than what he is. And so Adam is a type of the human race, and Christ is the antitype of a new race, of a new creation of which he's going to begin and build. And so all of history is God painting a portrait of redemption. And so I want you to hear this commentator, Douglas Moo. He said, all people stand in relation to one of two men whose actions determine the eternal destiny of all who belong to them. Either one belongs to Adam and under the sentence of death because of his sin and his disobedience, or one belongs to Christ and is assured of eternal life and his right, righteous acts and his obedience. These two actions have epic significance. We can't downplay this, how big it is. And so as we consider our salvation, these two acts are the only things that matter. Adam ate, Christ died. Which boat are you in? Let's look at our outlines. If you want to put them up on the screen. I'm going to break this down in three weeks. Three weeks, we're going to look at Romans 5, 12 through 21, and we're going to look at it in five parts. And verse 12 is the first part of the type, and that's the first Adam, and he's going to lay that typology out. We'll look at that this morning. And then there's a parenthesis after that, which is the, the proof of his position of the first Adam, and that's in verses 13 through 14. And then in verses 15 through 17, this is crazy, it's a parenthesis within a parenthesis. <laughs> and so it, it's going to show that Adam is a type of Christ. And then our fourth point is he's going to come back to his typology after all those parentheses, and it's going to be the second Adam, Jesus Christ, in verses 18 through 19. And then we're going to spend one Sunday just looking at the conclusion that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So, you ready to journey? Okay. First part of the type in verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. <clears throat> just as suggests a comparison or a contrast, through one man, Adam, and I just want you to hear this, there's, there's a false teaching that's spreading throughout our land, our seminary professors, and they're, they're questioning whether Adam was a real man, uh, whether he was just a convention or a picture that didn't really exist. And so the, the first man has to be as real as Christ for this typology to work. This is the first human. He's a real man. He came into history. If, if he didn't, this whole thing falls apart. So it's just simple. I just want to start with, this is a real man, the first man that God created. Second, because of him, Sin entered into the world. We go back to, 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 to the garden and we see the physical and the spiritual carnage. And there was a time when there was no sin in this cosmos at all. Yet when Adam sinned, this word just takes your breath away, it entered into the world. Oh, Adam, what have you done? Sin has entered into paradise. Sin entered the world. And I want you to hear this. It brought its ruling and reigning and destructive power 
to this creation. Everything beautiful about paradise is now marred that Adam sinned. And we cannot fully enjoy now all of God's beauties and blessings because of sin. It entered the world, and I'm telling you, it's why this world is as it is. It's our great enemy. Sin established its rule and reign in every heart. And the power of sin was established and it entered in to the world. Such damage. Relationships and personal sins and all that it's brought in, so much destruction. It brought ruin. And we don't need to hire an investigator or the FBI. We're told who started it. One man destroyed the whole created order. Shalom and life in God and now unrest and death and separation from God. One event. And then Paul says, and from that, now death enters in through that sin. In Genesis 2.17, God said, from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And in the Hebrew, it says, dying you shall die. Dying you shall die, Adam. And so that which is so unnatural, death, has now entered into this world. And death came in through sin. That which kills all things. Physical death, spiritual death, it comes in and so now everyone who lives dies. It's the one enemy that the world just fights and despises and we all suffer from it and feel its pains and Christmas season exalts it and brings it out. Those who won't be at our table this year. The Genesis account follows up then with Cain killing Abel. Then you come to Genesis 5, and it just goes, this person lived, this person lived. And what does it say? And he died. And he died. And he died. And you just keep watching the, the genealogy of death. And he died. The legacy of Adam. He died. It's a legacy of death and condemnation. And so death spread to all men. It's absolutely universal There's no escaping this. We were all in Adam. A comedian, George Burns, used to say, I don't believe in death. He's dead. Sin is the sting of death. And so as we look at this world, there are two things that cannot be denied. The universality of sin and the universality of death. And this is why. Adam, what have you done? So the reality of this passage is very sobering. You've been born in Adam. You come into this world in Adam. And so you're born into his sin and his guilt. Because of it, you will die. And if you die while being in Adam, you'll die a second death of eternity under the wrath of God. It's absolutely certain if you're in Adam. And I want you to look at this last phrase with me. Because all sin. This phrase has probably brought more articles, books, debates than any phrase in the Bible. There's just so much in it. And so the question then is, what what does it mean because all sin? How how did sin and death pass to the race from Adam? Why should something Adam did affect anyone? I've never met the guy. I don't even know what he looks like. He's ruined my whole life. Does that seem fair? Adam, what have you done? I just don't get it. And that's the big question. And it's not surprising that there's been so much debate here. And there are basically four main views in Christianity. When I preached it 20 years ago, and I I was laughing, I was probably on cassette tapes back then. But we went into each point and we examined them, why it didn't tie in. I'm going to spare you all that this morning. There's the view of Pelagius, Calvin, Augustine, and federalism is the view that we hold to as a church and that I'm going to share this morning. So just quickly to save a little time. But Pelagius basically said Adam was a bad example. Calvin was that it, but by the fall we're corrupted now and everyone has sin, which is true, but it's not what this passage is teaching. And Augustine says it's like a seminal view. We were all in Adam, so when he did it, it was like we were all there. But I'm going to try to explain to you federalism and what it means. So we're going to, if you want to learn those other views and wrestle with them and talk about them, come, come grab an elder, a teacher. It's worth digging in and talking about, but it's not the main view of this. That isn't what this text is teaching. 
So I'm going to just get to the heart of where Paul's taken this section. Federalism. God appointed Adam as the head and representative of the whole human race. And he would stand for the whole human race and he would be accounted either just or sinful on the basis of his disobedience or his obedience to God. We're all in, we're all in trial in Adam, so to speak. Whoever turned the air on, man, I love you. It's feeling really good up here. I might put my jacket back on. It's called federalism because of the analogy to the way like an ambassador might act on behalf of his country. When he signs a document or takes an action, he does so for each of the country's citizens. And when he does it, they're all bound by what he does. <laughs> the point, Adam represented them when he sinned and he was judged. And so are we. It's called original sin. So Adam's sin and guilt, I want you to hear this, is imputed to every one of us. Imputation. Adam represented, and when he blew it and fell, it, it was now imputed to your account because all sinned. And so the sin of guilt and death was put to your account. Adam was our representative head, and we're going to flesh that out next week thoroughly. But I'm going to move to just our second point, uh, and that is the verses 13 through 14 is the proof of this position. And I'm going to read verses 13 through 14. Paul's going to flesh it out. For until the law, sin was in the world. So before uh, Moses gave the law, God gave it to Moses. Um, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. So there's, there's no law to be imputed to your account. And yet, and he died, and he died, and he died. So with Adam until Moses, people are still dying. Uh, and he says, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who's a type of him to come. So sin is not imputed. It's not put to your account. Paul does not say when there is no law, there was no sin. But he says the flood proves that God regarded sin as sin. He flooded the earth. And then in Romans 5.20, he says the law comes, it, it was given to make sin a transgression. You're, you're transgressing what God has said and what he will punish clearly. And it puts it in the books. And Adam transgressed the clearly revealed will of God. Do not eat of this tree. And the day you do, you will die. So the point is Adam sinned. He broke a direct commandment of God. And Adam, who was meant to live forever, died. And the law doesn't come until Moses. And if there is no law, then there could be no breach. So those who lived between Adam and Moses did sin, but it was not reckoned against them, he says. There's no revealed law. They could not be condemned. Yet in spite of that, uh, they still died. Death reigned over them although they could not be accused of breaking a law that had not been given to them yet. And that's how a Jew would have thought, law, where is it at? So the question is, why did they all die then? And the answer is because all sinned in Adam. The original sin passed down to every one of his uh, progeny. So verse 14, it reigned even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. So death reigned even over those who didn't sin like Adam in transgression, or simply they didn't violate an express commandment carrying this out with the sanction of death. So this can't mean that all sinned in practice, but rather imputation from our representative head of Adam. So this reign of death, I want you to catch this, and that was, you might not have followed all that, I don't even know if I did, but this reign of death upon all of mankind proves that we were represented by Adam in that garden. When he sinned, we all sinned. And I read the paper every day and the brokenness and what I see in my own heart and those around me, our problem's not our environment. It's not our society. It's not your upbringing. It's not your lack of education. It's not you know, your need to evolve. The reason we're so broken is when Adam sinned, we all sinned. And he plunged us all into this destruction 
that, it, that all of humanity now lives in. So anyone that is born of a seed of human inherits the original sin of Adam. And that is what is wrong. That's why you don't have to teach a baby to, to scream and yell and, and all the things that they, they just, we know it from the womb. We come forth, it says, speaking lies. Even in sin, my mother conceived me, said David. So, this is where it gets good. Wake up. What do you think is the number one response to the teaching of what I just said? You can yell it out if you want. Louder? I'm, I'm hard of hearing. That's goofy. That's goofy. Who said that? <laughs> it is goofy. What else? Okay. Goofy, I like. Um, but it, goofy is about to turn beautiful. And not fair is about to become the greatest charge you could ever claim. That's not fair. It's not fair that I, I, I didn't do anything. Adam did it. I wasn't there. God, you're going to destroy my whole life, all of humanity, because of Adam? It just doesn't seem fair to me. And there's something so much bigger going on here that we'll look at next week, but I'm going to give you a little bit this morning to go to the table. Federalism is a proof of God's grace. It's the most merciful way for God to have dealt with us. And this is exactly the way, I want you to catch this, that God deals with us in Christ. Christ is our federal head, and his righteousness is put to your account. And God looks at you, child of God, as if you are perfectly righteous this morning, as if you really did live the life that Jesus lived. Is that fair? <laughs> I didn't do the righteousness. That isn't fair. Why are you giving me your righteousness? I didn't even do anything. Same reason you got the sin. You didn't do anything. Adam did it. It was given to you. It was imputed to you. Okay? So by faith, God reckons that this righteousness is as if it's mine. Jesus hangs on a cross, dying for my sin, as if I'm really there. He's representing me. He's my representative head. So my sins are being punished, and, and the justice of God is being poured out on the Son, and it, this is, I'm right there. There's my representative head. It's being put to my account. All the, the wrath and punishment that my sins deserve, I'm being treated as if Jesus hung on that cross in my place. You want to cry unfair? You're right. That's unfair that Christ had to be born into this world and leave glory and be spit on and nailed up to a cross and be rejected and die. That's not fair. <laughs> and now I'm treated as if I did what Christ did. That is unfair. So don't cry out unfair. <laughs> That's your hope of glory. I want you to think of something like this. Don't cry out, man. I, I, if, why didn't you let me represent myself? Give me a chance. Put me in that garden and I'll show you how to do it. Huh. Right. So if you want to be judged in and of yourselves, there's someone who was done, they were treated that way. Do you know who it is? The angels. And the angels that sinned are fallen angels and they can never be recovered. And they will be damned forever because they were represented in what they did. And they, they can't have a redeemer. Is that really what you want? If you don't have a representative head in Adam, you can't have a representative head in Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, imputation of sin is the sweetest thing I've ever known because now I can have the imputation of Jesus Christ for my hope and my glory. Oh. Adam and Christ are epic, but they are not equal. One swallows up the work of the other. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. Here, here it is. The second Adam can just swallow up everything that the first Adam did, and we do get to stare at that all next week. So Christmas, Christ pulled up on the shores of our humanity, and he undo, undid the curse by being a curse in our place. The old Christmas hymn, as far as the curse is found, he has come and he has redeemed the people for himself. Isn't that the best news ever? So let's close out with a little application. I just want you to ask, Adam 
or Christ. By Adam, sin entered the world and we all died. Physically, spiritually, and eternally. That is the fundamental problem of every human. Sin and condemnation are ours on account of Adam. It can't be ignored. And now you've spent your whole life because of that, multiplying your condemnation by actual your own sin against God on a daily basis. So you get original sin, you're separated from God, you're self-centered, and you just spend your whole life now sinning against this God. And so here's this great condemnation that there's no way to get out from under by your own workings. It can't be ignored. If we stay in Adam, I want you to hear this, you will perish. In Adam, all die. There won't be 75 saved on that sinking ship of humanity. There is only one remedy between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus. Only one work that can ever overcome the work of Adam, and that's why I've given my life to this message, because there's a way to be brought out from being in Adam and being brought to be in Christ. And it's the captain of our salvation. Anyone who will receive the work and free gift of God in Jesus Christ this morning by faith will be saved from the wreckage and the destruction of Adam. And you will be brought safely to the shores of heaven. Oh, Adam or Christ for the captain of your ship. Christ took the freight of your boat all the consequences of sin that would have cast you into the deepest, darkest sea for all of eternity. He's taken that freight upon himself and he went up on Calvary's tree and he bore the wrath of God for what our sins deserve. He was destroyed for the sake of our souls and he's now been raised to life to rescue you and bring you to the port of the heavenly city. Which boat are you on? This morning, we get to remember the second Adam. We get to come to the table and realize that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so what a privilege now to come and to, to remember how sweet this is. And, and, and the one thing I can't get over, we'll look at next week, is the typology, is that God paints all of history like he, he has Adam be a representative head and to bring the destruction and thousands of years later, Christ would come in and be a representative head and bring, I, I just want you to see that God is just coloring this beautiful portrait of redemption through all of history. Just sit and marvel. Who comes up with this? He should be worshiped with such a gospel and what God has done for the first and second Adam. So let's pray and we will come to the table together. Father, I come before you and I just thank you. I thank you for federalism. God, I thank you that Adam wrecked me. Thank you that as, as real as I feel the consequences of that wreckage every day in my own heart, your righteousness is just as real that's been put to my account and set me free from the dominion of sin. God, I thank you for this gospel. I thank you for amazing grace. And I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the author of it. God, we love you. And I pray now, bless us at the table. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.